Okay, there are no students here. Uh, what I want to do real quick here is, this is kind of a unique deal. Uh, the video you're going to watch, if you watch this one, is a bit of a bonus video. Now, I, rem I, I know that what I'm about to say is going to cause a lot of people to stop this video and not watch it. But for those of you who are enrolled in my Accounting 2 class, you are not responsible for any of the information that I'm going to cover in the video that follows this. The reason I'm putting this video out there, though, is there's a lot of people who watch these. Uh, and I'm going to be talking in this video that follows about the interpretation of cash flow statements. The mechanics of doing a cash flow statement, you are responsible for, accounting to students. And I'm very clear on that. But as far as analysis and interpretation, that's more of a managerial accounting subject. However, about a year ago, I taped some stuff in regards to analyzing and interpreting a cash flow statement. And I wanted to go ahead and put it out there on public YouTube for those uh, who are interested. Okay, so um, after my little introduction here, it'll edit it into a, a session that we taped. It'll be different students, and uh, I talk about analyzing and interpreting the cash flow statement, which is important, but is probably beyond the scope of accounting to, um, and is more of a managerial accounting subject. So uh, this next video that follows, if you're enrolled in my class, you're not responsible for this information, but if you're just watching these videos, I thought you might find it helpful. So. I hope you enjoy this bonus video. Thank you. What I want to do now is I want to talk about analysis of financial statements. Okay? We know how to prepare them, hopefully. Okay? But going to this, okay, we know how to prepare a cash flow statement. What does this all mean? What does this all mean? Well, that's a good question, okay? To kind of take you into this, let me do a little analogy here, all right? Let's say that we have three new graduates, and there are three new graduates from the university, and they have their accounting degrees. We have Nancy, Scott, and Ted, and they are all determined that they are going to make it big, okay? And so they decide to have a contest. And the contest is this, which person can increase their personal balance of cash the most in one year, okay? Who can increase their personal balance of cash the most in one year, okay? So you understand the challenge here? Well, a year goes by and the results are in, okay? Nancy increased her cash balance by 50,000 even. Scott also increased his cash balance by 50,000. What a coincidence. And if you think that's a coincidence, wait till you see this. Ted also increased his cash balance by 50,000. So they all increased their respective cash balances by the same amount, is that correct? So were they all equally successful? Well, the question is, is how did each person accomplish this increase in cash. All right, well, Nancy increased her cash balance. She started her own consulting business. And her first year revenues were in excess of 110,000. Now, obviously that's not the same as her cash increase because she had expenses there, right? Okay. So she started her own consulting business, had revenues in excess of 110. Well, how did Scott accomplish his 50,000 increase in cash. Well, he sold an automobile that his parents had previously given him as a gift. And he also cashed in some of his retirement savings. But in fact, his cash did increase by 50,000. You with me? What about old Ted? Ted increased his cash balance by obtaining a loan from a local bank, and he collateralized it with uh, equity that he, that he had in his house. Well, can you see what I'm getting at here? What I'm getting at here is not all cash flows are equal. Is that correct? Who do you think was more successful in this? Nancy was, okay? Nancy was the most successful, okay? Now, I want you to look at this 
And I want you to see that really what this is analogous to is an operating cash flow. Do you see that? Because this is cash flow generated from the operations of her new business. Okay? Am I right? Sometimes we say that cash flow that is operating is more sustainable. It's more repeatable. Okay? Maybe she will have even a better year next year, right? Okay? Now let's look at Scott. Can you see what he did? He sold an, an automobile and he cashed in some uh, investments, right? Can you see where this is analogous to an investing cash flow? Isn't when we sell long term assets, isn't that an investing cash flow? Okay. Well, is he going to be able to sell an automobile every year? No. How long can he keep cashing in retirement savings? And eventually that's going to end, right? That's not as sustainable, is it? See where I'm getting at? Okay. Ted went and got a loan, right? Okay. He wants money. He must, he must be the American. He just goes and borrows it, right? Okay. So what kind of cash flow is this analogous to? A financing cash flow, right? This is analogous to a financing cash flow. Well, what do you think about it's to the sustainability of this action? Is he going to be able to keep getting loans? Probably not. Probably not. So even though all three of these people individually increased their cash flows by 50000 each, they're not equally successful, right? I think Nancy's clearly the winner here, right? Okay. Well, take that analogy and think of it as a business. Okay. Let's look at an example. Let's say, and I just, just have a uh, kind of an abbreviated cash flow statement for three different companies, Loggins, Traeger, and Flux. Now, each one of these companies have a net increase in cash of 15000 Okay? Now, which one, though, is most impressive? Well, let's start with Flux. Flux has a negative 24000 from operations. Now, do you see where that's a problem, folks? Operations of your business, that's supposed to be what's generating income, generating cash flow, right? It's costing him cash to generate his, to operate his business. So when you have a net operating, uh, or a, uh, when you have an operating activity and it's a negative number, that's problematic. You understand? Okay. Now, he, this company did, Flux did have 15,000 net increase in cash. Well, what did they do? Well, they sold some of their plant assets and they went and got a loan. Well, their cash increased, but can you see where that picture for Flux, this is not good. The operations are a net drain on cash. They're having to sell their plant assets. Well, those plant assets are probably there to help provide revenues and operate the business, right? So you start selling your plant assets, that's going to probably deter your ability to operate your business. And they're getting a loan, which they're going to have to pay back, right? Okay. Now, let's look at the one that's the most successful. The one that's most successful here is Logan's company, okay? Well, they generated $90,000 from their operating activities. That's good, isn't it? As a rule of thumb, you like that operating number to be positive. That's why you're in business, is to conduct these operations. Now, what did they do? They had some good cash flow from their operating activities. Well, they purchased some plant assets. Hopefully, they purchased these because they feel like that'll be beneficial in generating future business and revenues for their company and hopefully cash flow as well. 
And what else did they do with it? Well, they repaid some debt. They repaid some debt. Those are both good things, right? So there is no doubt that the Loggins Company is the star here, and then the Flux one is sad face, right? And I would probably say Traeger is somewhere in between, okay? They do have positive operating cash flow. They do, they were able to purchase some plant assets, right? They didn't pay off any debt, and so they're looking pretty good, but clearly I think Loggins is the winner here. Would you agree? All right? Okay, questions on that? What I want to get to is this fact right here. Investors focus on cash flows from operations more than those from investing in financing activities. And can you see why now? Cash flows from operations are seen as more sustainable, more repeatable. Okay? Cash flows from operations. Now, that's going to be abbreviated CFFO throughout the rest of this presentation. But cash flows from operations, that has the most focus from investors. Okay? Now, let's talk about cash flows from operations a little bit. This represents the cash flow, as I said, generated by the actual operations of the company. Okay? As I said, this is viewed as sustainable cash flow, something that can be repeated in future periods. Cash flows from operations, it is the most favored cash flow metric by investors. Okay? It is the one that people focus on a lot more. Okay? Now, many investors will use CFFO as sort of an alternative performance measure and favor it over accrual-based net income. Okay? Now we're going to come back to this, but in a way the some investors might say, hey look, I don't understand the accrual-based system. I didn't take accounting. Okay? I don't know what this matching principle is. I don't know what this revenue recognition... Uh, I want to look at your cash flows from operations because in my opinion, if you're generating cash flows from your operations, that's good enough for me. You with me? Management knows this. Management knows that, they, that investors focus on CFFO, okay? However, we need to have a big caution here. We need to have a big caution here. First of all, please be aware that net income, which is performed on the, or calculated on the accrual-based system, and CFFO, they need to be trending together, okay? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is this, okay? If this is dollars and this is, okay? You know, if this is your net income, kind of rising over time, well, your CFFO should be, it's not gonna be the same number, but it should be kind of trending the same way, right? Are you with me? Now there has been situations where the exact opposite happened. One number was going this way and the other number was going this way. And sometimes this is net income and this is CFFO and sometimes this is CFFO and this is net income. This is a problem and you should be concerned, okay? These should trend together, okay? All right. Ask me any questions as we go along if you have them. Okay, another thing we need to be cautious about is this. Do not be fooled into thinking that cash flow cannot be manipulated. Do not be fooled into thinking that cash flow cannot be manipulated. Okay? Come off that for a second. When I teach accounting one, I tell them very quickly we're going to use the accrual base, basis of accounting. 
and I teach them the revenue recognition principle, the matching principle. And some students think, I think it'd be easier to manipulate it if you use the accrual basis, right? Because you might be recognizing revenue, you haven't even received the cash yet, right? No. It is easier to manipulate things with a cash basis. Because think about it. At the end of the year, couldn't I say to my people, um, don't pay any bills. Don't pay any bills in December. We'll worry about it in January, the new fiscal year. But we want, we want to make things look as good as they can. Okay? Or you could also, customers are prepaying you for services or products that you have not yet received. You're receiving cash flow. We'll, we'll provide the products and services later. Just give us the money now. Do you see how easy it would be to manipulate? Okay. The cash flow, the cash basis of accounting is something that can really be manipulated. Okay. Now there are people who haven't had accounting classes who don't understand this and they think quite the opposite. They think well, the reason I ca focus on the cash flow uh, statement is I know cash flow cannot be manipulated. It's e cash is either coming in or it's going out. That's a, dangerous, that's a dangerous way of thinking. Now, I'm not saying the cash flow statement is not useful. It is very useful. But you can't go into it thinking these erroneous ideas. Cash flow can be manipulated. I just gave you two examples of it, right? Okay holding off on bills and trying to collect early. All right? Okay. All right. Another thing we need to be cautious about. Management knows that investors scrutinize cash flow from operations. And some of their choices that management makes, it can be influenced by a desire to present a favorable CFFO to investors. You see what I'm saying? They know that CFFO is the most favored son. It's the one that people really want to look good. Yeah, investing and financing, you want those to look too, but we really want cash flow from operations to look good. Are you with me? Well, where does that lead us? Well, we have a problem. The rules on how to classify cash flows are sometimes a little bit vague, okay? And international accounting rules, if anybody's watching this and they live in a different country, please know that some international rules for how you classify cash flows vary. For example, um, payment of taxes with United States generally accepted accounting principles is always an operating activity. There's other countries where sometimes it's a, it's a financing or an investing activity, okay? Another one, I think we treat dividends received as, uh, as an operating cash flow. Some companies treat it as a financing cash flow. Now, there's not a lot of differences, but be aware, if you're comparing two different companies and one's international, they might have slightly different rules. Okay? But let's go back to this. Let's not focus on international. Let's focus on the fact that management knows that people scrutinize CFFO closer and they have some latitude in how they classify it. Some of the rules are not as black and white as perhaps they should be, okay? So here's the situation that you get into. Let me do a little analogy here. Let's say we have a barrel of apples, okay? Now some of the apples are red and they look delicious, okay? And there's a few in there though that are not so good of apples, okay? These kind of these yellow and brown ones, right? Kind of smell a little bit, right? And you know, hey, that's how life is. Life gives us some, some good apples. Life gives us some bad apples, right? And every company is going to have some good apples and some bad apples as far as some, some good things and some bad things, right? Well, what management does is this. They know that people are focusing on the part of the, the barrel that they can see most easily. So what do you think they do with these bad apples? Well, they, they, they push those down a little bit. They put those down here, okay? Oh, look at that barrel of apples. Well, that barrel of apples is actually the same as this barrel of apples. 
All they have done is taken these stinky apples and put them down in the basket that's not as easily seen. Okay? Well, the analogy here is those red apples that are on top that are most visible, those are your operating cash flows. You want those to look nice. And those stinky apples, ugh, they don't make us look so good. Those are our investing and financing cash flows. Let's see if we can push that stuff down to what's not, not, so, uh, not so easily noticed. You see what I'm saying? Management wants to make their CFFO look nice. Okay? Now I want to look at a fictitious company, Irwin Landscaping. And I want to see how this decision on where to classify cash flows could make a huge difference on how one perceives that cash flow statement. Okay? All right, I got to get out of this here a little bit and open up something in Excel. So let me do that real quick. Okay. See this over here? This is in blue. And these are actually exactly the same thing for now. But let's say this over here in blue. That is the cash flow statement that Irwin Landscaping Company prepares for the year ended December 2015. All right, just take a look and drink that in. What's our net operating cash flows? Negative 690. Ooh, that's not good, is it? What's our net investing cash flows? Positive 14.2. What's our uh, financing cash flows? Negative 22. And we have a net change in cash of an 84.90 decrease. Is that correct? Okay. Now, what is it that just looks kind of yucky? This right here, correct? Well, I want you to picture a management that says, okay, hmm, <sighs> the people who look at our financial statements are not going to be thrilled with a negative number on our operating cash flows line. That doesn't look good. Is there some way we can maybe pretty this up a little bit? Okay, is there something we can do? Now, one thing that you can do is you can push the bad stuff down into the investing and financing section like we did the apples. The other thing you can try to do is bring the good apples up to the top like we saw as well, right? Let's see how they might try to do that. Well, let's say they said, I tell you what, we sold a truck for sixteen five. Yes, that's a plant asset, but I don't know. Is there any way, is there any way we could somehow maybe get that up into the operating section? Okay. And let's say, let's just, let's see what would happen if we, if we could somehow include that 16500 up here. We'll get rid of it down here. Okay. Um, and we'll just say, uh, you know, uh, decrease in other assets, okay? Decrease in other assets or something like that. Well, hey, that looks a lot better, doesn't it? Doesn't that look a lot better? But let me ask you, this is a landscaping business. Is selling their fixed assets, selling trucks, is that really what they're in the operations for? No. They have taken an obvious investing activity and tried to make it into an operating activity to make this look a little nicer. And they did make it look a little nicer, did they not? Okay. Here's another thing that they could do. Now, I want to be careful here. And I have to kind of, re not redact, but modify something that I said. Okay, I want to go back to some initial things that I told you uh, a couple of uh, sessions ago that, like I said, we need to modify a little bit. Uh, remember when we were calculating operating cash flows on this worksheet? And one of the first things I said was we need to analyze the changes in uh, current assets and in current liabilities. And we need to handle them, the, them as it says in this chart. Okay. You might remember when we talked about that. You also might remember when I said that uh, when we were learning how to classify cash flows, let me back that up a little bit so you all can see it, 
you might remember that I said a rule of thumb was that investing activities have a tendency to be long-term assets, have to do with long-term assets. And financing activities have a tendency to be with long-term liabilities and equity. You all remember when I said that, right? Well, I need, to, I need to give you an exception. And I didn't give this on purpose back then because uh, I just wanted to get you in the basic, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, educate you on the basics of this and then talk about the exceptions later. But I need to modify that a bit. Let's say that we had a, for example, let's say that we had a, a short-term note payable. And let's say it's a short-term note payable. Let's say it's a nine-month. A short-term note, note payable that is due in nine months. Okay, my question to you is this. Is this a current liability? Is this a current liability? Yes. This is a current liability, okay? Because it's nine months, right? Well, from these two pieces of information that I gave you earlier, you might be led, understandably, to believe that a change in a short-term note payable would be handled in the operating section of the cash flow statement because it's a current liability. We'd analyze the change there. And, and as I said, that uh, financing have a tendency to be long-term uh, liabilities. So yes, this is a current liability, but we do not account for a change in a short-term note payable in the operating section. We account for it in the financing section, even though it's a current liability, okay? And we'll look at our spreadsheet here in a second. But what we really need to do is almost make an exception to this chart. And again, I didn't want to go here earlier because I didn't want to confuse you all. But we almost need to make an exception and say the following. Put an asterisk there. And say note. Even though short-term even though short-term note payable is a current liability, the change in this account would not be considered in calculating operating cash flows, as the chart above may seem to indicate. Instead, a change in short-term note payable would be considered a financing activity and thus handled in the financing section of the cash flow statement. All right? Now let's take a look back at that Excel spreadsheet. Now, do we all agree that borrowing on a five-year note payable, that is clearly a financing activity, is it not? But let's say somehow that they could borrow, instead of on a five-year notes payable, let's say they could borrow on a nine-month note payable. Well, if we didn't have the exception to this rule, you could take this out and do a increase in short-term note payable plus how much did I how much did we borrow thirty thousand and boy now did we just make this sweet or what you see what I'm saying but borrowing on a short-term note payable if you allow that to be an operating activity do you see where that's just gonna get abused in a big way People are going to borrow huge sums of cash so that they can beef up that CFFO, make it look really nice. Because when they show people here, they'll go, hey, look at this. Look at that, baby. Woo-hoo. Look at that, 45810 from operations. And they're going to try to make you believe like that is sustainable. And it is not, is it? Again, we know that this is the true income statement. I'm sorry, the true cash flow statement, right? You understand what I'm saying? 
So, you cannot do that. Even if it is a short term note payable, it has to go down here. Okay? So that is kind of an exception to that rule that I told you about. Okay? Do you understand? There's other exceptions. I'm not going to go there today. Okay? These are subjects for more advanced accounting classes. But there is a lot of literature out there about companies who try to beef up their CFFO and they will try to misclassify things knowing that people focus on it. Are you with me? That's what I wanted to get at. You have to be careful. You have to be careful when you look at these cash flow statements. Okay? Well, um, let's start to conclude here. All right, well, Dave, you told us all the things that could go wrong. How can we read this cash flow statement with intelligence? Okay, well, let's conclude by focusing on a few key points. All right? All right. Number one, you need to analyze the cash flow statement in conjunction with the balance sheet and the income statement. Do you remember the first time we were together? I compared it to the judicial, the executive, and the legislative branch and how those need to provide checks and balances. Okay? Well, it's that same way. Look at this document camera. Okay? You've got the balance sheet. You've got the income statement. And you've got your cash flow statement, right? Be wary of companies that say, "Hey, take a look at our uh, take a look at our balance sheet and our income statement." Man, those look good, don't they? And you go, what's under your hand? Don't, don't worry about what's under my hand. Take a look here. Man, is that sweet? Or sometimes they say this, look at that. Now, most of the times that doesn't work because everybody wants to see the income statement. Oh, do you have a good bottom line? Do you have a positive bottom line? Okay. So a lot of bankers will do this. Oh, got a good looking income statement. Good looking cash flow statement. Boy, you need some more money? We'll loan it to you. Okay? And uh, what's your balance sheet look like? Well, don't worry about that. Look at these. Woo! Those look pretty. No. You need to look at the whole, you need to look at the whole picture. Okay? Because if management is trying to do something that misrepresents themselves, a lot of times it will show up on one of the other statements. Okay? Now, United States recently went through a huge credit crisis where we loaned a lot of money out to people who will never be able to pay it back. It was largely due to people loaning money to businesses that should never have money loaned to them. Now you might think that somebody who makes hundreds of thousands of dollars is very adept at looking at financial statements. And they're not always. They're, they've become more adept. But you need to be able to look at these three in conjunction with each other. That's the first point I wanted to emphasize. Okay? What's the next one? Focus on trends in the data. Focus on trends in the data. Okay? Here's another thing that bankers do. I don't mean to beat up on bankers. There's some good ones. But there's also some that all they do is they look, they get your cash flow, I'm sorry, they get your income statement. They look to see if the bottom line is positive. And if it is, they might look at last year's positive net income, positive net income. Sounds like you're doing great. And that's the extent and they put it in the folder. What I'm saying here is we need to focus on trends in the data. Okay? Let me give you an example. Okay? Let me give you an example. Let's say, and some people do this, they will graph over time, they will graph how much they weigh. Okay? Now let's say this is over a three or four year period of time. Okay? And you know when you go to the doctor, they weigh you every time, don't they? They're doing this. But let's say somebody's weight over three or four years is doing this.
Okay. Well, they're clearly gaining some weight, are they not? Well, here's the problem. A lot of people, they don't ever look at any trends. They look at this year and last year. And they'll say, oh, that doesn't look so bad. Oh, that doesn't look so bad. Yeah, maybe a little bit. You see what I'm saying? That doesn't look so bad. That doesn't look so, oh, look, you actually lost some weight. You're doing great. You're doing great, okay? Well, let's look at the trend here, okay? That's when you see some very powerful metrics, okay? The example I always use is this, okay? I have an 18-year-old son, and we have a photo album, and every year we put his school picture in there, okay? Here's the kindergarten one. The next page is his first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. Clear up to now, he's senior year, right? If I take any of those pictures that are by each other, he doesn't look that different, does he? Just maybe a little. But by golly, if I compare his kindergarten picture to his senior year picture, that's massive change, isn't it? That's looking at a 12-year trend instead of a two-year trend. You with me? A lot of financial statements are only prepared with this year and last year. That's not enough of a trend. You with me? Okay. What else should we do? Well, we need to use appropriate benchmarks when available. You know what a benchmark is? Certain events. What I mean in this case is like, are there industry averages out there? Okay? Are, are there industry averages? Now, I didn't go into some of the metrics that are used in cash flow statements. There's, there's different measurements like free cash flow or cash flow from operations divided by total assets or average assets. These are different metrics that you can trend over time. Okay? And sometimes you can calculate that and compare it to benchmarks. One, one meaningful benchmark is your own previous data, but sometimes they'll have industry averages and in trade publications or things like that. Okay? All right. What's another point here? Look for large swings when available, or, or look for large swings in balance sheet accounts in the operating section. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to take you way back to one of the first ones that we did. Okay? Okay? And that was OTW. Okay? This is OTW. Well, this is a really large swing an increase in inventory of 112,500. That is a big part of this positive cash flows from operating activities, is it not? That is what I am talking about. Look for big swings in balance sheet accounts. Is it good to have a huge increase in inventory? What does that often mean? It means nobody is buying your inventory. Correct? So you need to be careful. You need to be wary. Okay? Not each item in the calculation of the operating cash flow is equal either. All right? Remember, the focus should be on sustainable cash flows. Sustainable cash flows. Are you with me? Can it be repeated? Okay? Now we're going to do one more thing when I'm done with these slides. But I want to point out that this is a great book. It's called fi Financial Shenanigans, How to Detect Accounting Gimmicks and Fraud in Financial Reports. This is a book that I have read and I certainly have used. Uh, there's things I've learned and things that I've talked about, no doubt, that came from this book. Okay? So, I'm, you know, I want to make sure that you're aware that this book exists. This is a very easy to read book. It's not written in accounting legalese. It's very interesting, okay? But this was one of the best books that I ever read that, that taught me how to understand a cash flow statement, okay? So I want you to be aware of that, all right? Okay, one last thing, a couple last things I want to do real quick is I want to look once again at this rose now. Remember when we did that? I want you to see that 
This company doesn't look so hot. This is the cash flow statement you prepared for today. Look at that cash used in operating activities. Well, again, it's a net, their operating activities, you would hope would not be a net drain on cash, correct? What else is in there? Well, there's an increase in accounts receivable. Well, are people paying us slower? I don't know, we might need to investigate that. We have an increase in inventory, and that stands out. Remember when I talked about large swings in balance sheet accounts? For the size of this company, whoops, wrong line. For the size of this company, that should stand out. Why is our inventory increasing so much? Are people not wanting what we're selling anymore? That could be a problem for future periods, could it not? Okay. Um, we bought some equipment. Um, we issued some stock. It almost looks like, I mean, look how bad our, our decrease in cash would be if we wouldn't have issued that stock. It would be negative 11,150 if we would not have issued stock and sold ownership in our own company. And let me tell you, a negative 11,000 drop when you're talking about a cash balance of that amount, that is huge, is it not? Holy smokes, okay? It would have gone down to thir from 30,000 to about 19,000. That's about a 40%, 45% decrease in cash. But we sold some stock, okay? Maybe to try to, you know, save ourselves a little bit. But I want you to know, with your, with your new analytical skills, can you look at this and say, hmm, there's some concerns here. You with me? All right. Any questions on that, guys? All right. Well, um, if there's no questions, that is pretty much the end, okay? Now, for those of you who are watching this, um, more than likely there's some other things on this uh, website contained in the shell of this class that you can do. And those things I'll probably uh, not lecture in a setting like this, but I will be talking through like a Camtasia PowerPoint or something like that. But uh, that is pretty much it. Is there any other questions that you guys have? Do you feel like you understand cash flow statement better than you did two weeks ago? Okay, like I said, you'll, you, you will use this a lot in life, okay? And uh, we just touched on the very, the most elementary concepts of analysis of a cash flow statement. But as you go on in your business and your educational careers, hopefully you will get more depth at that. The book that I referred to is a great start. All right? Any questions? All right, guys. Thanks a lot. We'll see you later.